Let's look at this uh, problem that you voted off the island. We uh, have two views. We have a side view and an end view. And this end view is from this end here. Uh, and what we see is that if we close this switch, this being the positive terminal of the battery, conventional current will flow out of the positive terminal and it'll go up the front and down the back. Now, if I'm looking from this end down here, uh, up the front and down the back looks like it's going clockwise. Okay? Now, that's going to make this into a bar magnet, and by right-hand rule number three, the north side of that bar magnet is going to be on this end, the south side on that end. Now, this is one of those problems where we're looking on the side of the solenoid, not in the middle of the solenoid, and not at the ends of the solenoid, but at the sides. And there we have to use the fact that the field lines come out of the north, and then circle back around so they can go in the south. But they make complete loops. Now again, if I'm looking from the side, from this side, that field line looks like it's coming towards me. So if I look at this as my copper loop, and this is my solenoid or coil, down here, I'm looking for the induced current in the copper loop. Well, my initial flux was zero. My final flux was out of the page. Well, what do I have to add to zero to get out of the page? My change in flux external is out of the page, and that means that my induced flux will fight that change and be into the page. Now, if I'm going to send induced <coughs> flux into the page, use the right thumb of your right hand, it's the only thumb you have on your right hand, by the way, okay? and. Your right hand is going to tell you the direction that induced current will have to flow in order to make those field lines. It's going to have to go around clockwise. Check that your neighbor got that right, otherwise slap them up good. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> or blow bubbles out. <laughs> Silly Susie. Don't, don't be <laughs> Okay. Uh, I should have pointed out, um, tomorrow I will be calculating your participation grade. Everyone that gets at least 80% of the clicks during the semester will get 100% of those participation points. So tomorrow afternoon when you check your D2L, D2L score, if your participation score is zero, that means we still don't have your clicker attached to your name. So you need to send me an email so that we can go dumpster diving looking for your, your points. Okay? Um, check your uh, participation grade tomorrow afternoon. Okay, let's just review for a moment. Last day we talked about a generator which is just a coil of copper that's turning in an external magnetic field. And by turning it, I change the number of field lines that go through the loop. Well, changing the number of field lines is going to induce a current. That current is what lights up our city. Induced current. We, we light our cities through induction. Okay? Now, the direction of this current is easy to calculate or figure. It's going to be in a direction that will fight my motion. 
this current to light up our city has to come at some expense, at my expense. I have to do positive work. I have to fight to make this coil go around. And we found when Pat was trying to turn that generator, the more current that's in this coil, the bigger the fight. Well, that tells me the direction of the current. The current has to be in a direction so that the dipole is being anti-aligned with the field. That dipole wants to be lined up with the field. It's a compass needle. If I'm turning it away from the field direction, I have to fight, okay? And once I get it anti-aligned, well now, it would want to line up and it would be helping the motion, except that nature won't allow that. Nature switches the direction of the current, so again, I have to fight. I fight all the way around, not just halfway around, all the way around. And that's where the energy comes from to light up the cities. The falling water that turns the turbines. Now, we found that whenever we had an electric motor, and we were using that electric motor to do some task by turning uh, a coil, we also had a generator involved. And we found that there were two flavors of current that were going through the coil in the motor. The first type of current is the battery current. And the direction of that battery current, we decide. And by we, I mean the engineers that built that motor. They decide what direction it goes by a careful use of the commutators, the bushings, the, uh, the brushes, okay? And they always make that current go in such a direction that the dipole is going to want to be lined up. And so this dipole, think of it as a compass needle, is just naturally going to want to line up. And that's what's going to turn the motor, okay? Now that energy is going to come at the expense of the battery. The battery has to supply the energy. But as soon as that motor starts turning in a magnetic field, it also is a generator. And that's going to bring us a second current. This current is going to create a dipole that is going to fight the motion. Now if this dipole is helping the motion and this dipole is fighting the motion, those two currents must be in opposite directions. And that's what they will be in a motor. One will be fighting the other, okay? And as this rotates, the red one will always be in a direction by use of the commutator, such that it will be helping the motion. And the green one will always be in a direction by Faraday's law to fight the motion. Okay? Now, here's the example that we quickly looked at at the end of the day. When we plugged in this coil that had a, a resistance of 4 ohms, V equals IR gave us 120 volts equals I, 4 ohms. That gives us a current of 30 amps. Huge. Once that motor starts turning, we develop a back EMF that essentially uh, sends current the other way. And that means it's a voltage that's directed the other way. So now my V equals IR, I have the battery pushing one way with 120 volts. I have the back EMF pushing the other way, so I subtract it with 118 volts equals I times 4 ohms. That gives me 2 volts pushing current to 4 ohms, and that's going to give me a current of half an amp. Now that's what we design our motors to handle, half an amp or an amp. That's a reasonable amount of current. 30 amps is just not reasonable. But fortunately, I only have that 30 amps for a short spike of time while I'm starting the motor. Now we remember from 205 that it takes a torque to get something rotating. We have to angularly accelerate it. But once it's turning, it just wants to keep turning. That's rotational inertia. 
And, and all we have to fight at that point is friction. Okay? And so when we first plug in our motor, we get a large current to get it going, to give us the torque to start it turning, and then it very quickly goes down to uh, a very small current just to keep it going, just to fight the friction. Now I'll give you a, a, an example of this. Um, many years ago, my redheaded son was helping around the house by dust busting our car. Now my redheaded son is the one that's going to graduate as an orthodontist in three weeks. I'm going out to the graduation. If you can believe it, he was the only one of our children who was obsessed with money. He would do anything to earn money. And hence, he's going to be a dentist. Have you ever noticed that about dentists? I mean, I interview a whole lot of people to go to, to medical school and dental school. And when the, the, the future doctors come in, they, yeah, they had a brother that was sick, and they just want to help humanity, and they just want to do good for everyone. And you ask a future dentist, so why? Oh, I want to make a lot of money, and I want to work three days a week so I can ski. <laughs> it's the, I get depressed. <laughs> anyway, it's okay in this case, because he's my, he's my retirement plan. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was dust busting our old Chrysler Cordoba with a corded dust buster, one that plugs in. And the next thing we know, he's screaming. I come out into the garage. There's smoke in the garage just filling it, and there's flame inside the car. And what happened, um, this big old Chrysler Cortoba has a huge hood and a great big old cable that would pop the hood. Well, over years, that cable broke, and I never fixed it, and it was just kind of hanging down behind the gas pedal. And so my son was just dust busting away, and suddenly he sucked up that cable, it clogged the, the, the motor, it stopped the motor from turning, and the next thing you know, he had 30 amps going through that thing instead of a half amp. Next thing was flames and screaming, and that was his first lesson about back EMF. You know, you've got to teach him young. <laughs> so, questions on this? Okay, we've got one last big idea, and it's a really, really fun one, um, and that is this idea of self-inductance. Now, that's not what it says up there. It says mutual inductance. I'm going to ease into this idea of self-inductance uh, with a, an in-between step. Let's talk about the mutual inductance between two coils. Now, if I have these two coils, one hooked up to an ammeter, and one that I can hook up to a battery, um, if I change the current in this coil, I'm going to induce a current in that coil. Let's call this the primary, the secondary. Can you see that induced current there? Just barely. It's just barely moving. Now, how could I make that induced current bigger, stronger? Yeah, put these closer together. And now, I get a bigger induced current. What I say is that these two coils are now more closely coupled. The field lines, when I, when I connect this to the battery, it becomes an electromagnet. The field lines spread out like any magnet. And when they're far apart, those field lines, not very many of them, make it through the secondary coil. But when they're right up next to each other, all the field lines generated by the primary go through the secondary. And that's why I get a bigger effect. Now if I take this bar of iron and put it between the two, that magnifies the effect greatly. You see that over there? What's happening is, as I, as I connect to the battery, this becomes an electromagnet. That then magnetizes this uh, iron rod, and, and that sends field lines, extra field lines, through that uh, secondary coil. Okay? So if I want to really have uh, the magnetic field in this coil connected to the magnetic field in that coil, I want them close together and I want the space in between filled with iron. 
Now you can see that even, even if they're far away, if I've got the iron rod, they're still pretty strongly connected because the magnetic, the iron rod is being magnetized and that's sending field lines over there. <coughs> now here's the idea. I can say that the number of field lines through the secondary coil is proportional to the current that flows through the primary coil. Okay? Now whenever I have a proportionality, I can replace that with an equal sign if I put in a constant, constant of proportionality. This constant is what we call the mutual inductance. And you can see what it means by setting this I equal to 1M. If this is 1, then M is equal to the flux. So that gives me an idea of what it means. For every 1 amp that I send through this coil, my mutual inductance tells me how many field lines go through the secondary coil. And I can make that M, that mutual inductance, bigger by putting the coils closer together and filling the space with iron. Okay? Now, if I use Faraday's law, that tells me that there's an invisible battery set up in that secondary coil that, if I use this principle here, depends on how quickly I change the current through the primary. Okay? The quicker I change the current through the primary, the bigger the battery that I set up in the secondary. Now you see this idea of mutual inductance a lot in transformers. Transformers will not be on the final exam, but you've experienced them in everyday life. You know that they're up on the top of a uh, telephone pole, and that every now and again they blow up, right? And when they blow up, your house is dark for a while. Well, a transformer is just two coils that are connected by an iron donut. You got essentially an iron donut with a coil on the left side and a coil on the right side. And we use these transformers to change the voltage. It turns out that when you're moving current across, say, a desert, you lose a lot of your power. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, power equals I squared R. <laughs> and so the bigger the current, the more you're losing uh, that power. And so they find that if they send that power across at very high voltage, they don't need very high current to get the same power. And so they send it across at tens of thousands of volts. Now you don't want tens of thousands of volts near your children or your pets. And so before it gets to your house, we step that down to 120. And we do that with a transformer. <coughs> It turns out that if you have two coils on an iron donut, and one of the coils has twice the turns, you're going to change the voltage by a factor of two. The one with the smaller number of turns is going to have half the voltage and twice the current. And so that's how we essentially uh, step voltage up and down. Now, that's not going to be on the final exam. That is, is there? So what causes them to explode? Ah, what causes them to explode um, is a, uh, a force that um, it turns out that there's an energy density inside there that is given by V squared over 2 mu naught. And the bigger the V, the bigger the energy inside there. And, and it's just a containment issue. I was working at Lawrence Livermore Labs where I was working on the supercomputers. They have the biggest supercomputer center there, or had, and there you would bid for time. You would say how many minutes you had that you needed for your run, say I need 10 minutes, and then you would tell them how many minutes you would pay for, and the time would go to the highest bidder. And that's how people would get their jobs done, they just, you know, 
if they had a grant, they'd say, I want two minutes and I'll pay for 10. And so I didn't have much money, so I was always running at very low priority. I was always the last person to get any computer time. One night at two in the morning, I was working uh, in my office and uh, everything went dark. One of the transformers in the lab uh, just blew. There was a great big huge bang. So rather than going home and calling it a night, I stayed. I stayed and at four o'clock, they got things back online. But everyone else had gone home. And I went into that supercomputer uh, list of who was on it, and I was the only one. And I said, give me a hundred minutes, and I'll pay you a penny. <laughs> I, my job ran all night long. I got uh, like four months of work done that one time. <laughs> anyway, that's not going to be on the test either. <laughs> now, we have a little pretest here. This is simple, simple, simple. You'll be able to do it in your head. <laughs> It's just going to get you thinking the right direction. Turn <laughs> simple. The battery current leaves the positive terminal of the battery and goes around clockwise. To find the induced current, I use the fact that field lines, external field lines, are coming out of the North Pole and going down through that loop. So I have an initial flux <laughs> down, and as the magnet gets closer, it gets bigger. That gives me a change in flux that is down. I fight that change with an induced flux up. Now, in order to have induced flux up, use the right thumb to represent that flux. The induced current has to go counterclockwise. Now, if I think of the total current as the sum of those two, my induced current has reduced the current through the resistor. But what if I had pushed a south pole down on that circuit? In that case, the induced current would be in the same direction as the battery current, and it would help the battery current. Now, in this case, I can either hurt or help the battery current with this induced invisible battery. It, it depends on how I bring that magnet down. We have things called inductors, where we also find that the induced current fights the real current and sometimes helps the real current and we have to keep those two ideas of uh, the two currents separate in our mind. Now an inductor is just a coil of wire and when we draw it on a schematic we usually separate it out into two elements. We realize that this three miles of wire has certain resistance and so we represent that as a resistor. And then the fact that it's coiled, we represent with this symbol here, and, uh, and it's measured, its inductance is measured in Henry's. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now folks, before we go any further, let me just point out that in all of analog electronics, there's only four things we deal with. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, and batteries. That's it. So this is not some obscure, gee, why do we have to deal with it before the final? This is the fourth piece of four. Okay? Now, what we find is that that coil is going to fight a change in flux through the coil. Now up until now, I've been telling you that there's two flavors of flux. That there's external flux and induced flux. And I did that because that was going to help you learn Lenz's Law. But I was lying to you. 
That coil can't tell the difference between external flux and induced flux. It just flux. And all it knows is that it doesn't like a change of flux through its own coil. Whether it's from someone else, like a magnet, or whether it's due to its own magnetic field. Okay, and we're going to find that that has very important effects on a circuit. What I could say is that the number of field lines that pass through a single coil depend on how much current is in that coil. It's proportional. If I double the current through this coil, I double the number of field lines. I replace that proportionality with a equal sign. I put in a constant of proportionality, and that constant of proportionality we call self-inductance. That's where we were headed. Now you can understand what self-inductance is, again, by setting I equal to one amp. Self-inductance is how many field lines go through this coil for every one amp that's going around the coil. How can I make that self-inductance bigger? Well, I could make more turns in the coil, or I could fill up the space inside the coil with iron, and that would give me more field lines for every one amp. Now, here's what that does to Faraday's law. I get an EMF in a single coil when I try to change the current through that coil. And the bigger the self-inductance, the bigger the invisible battery that will fight that change. Now, what this means is, oh, a coil will always fight the change in its own current. Now you've seen this in everyday life, I think. If you've ever unplugged something that has a coil in it, like a, a waffle iron, for instance. You unplug a waffle iron and you get a great big spark. Why is that? Well, inside a waffle iron you've got heating coils. But coils are coils. And any coil is going to fight a change in the current through it. And if you're unplugging it, you're trying to change the current from something to nothing. It will fight that change. It fights by sending a spark. Okay? Now, if I try to take the current through a coil from zero to some final value, say four amps, if I try to take it instantly, instantly, what does this formula give me for my invisible battery to fight that change? Delta I is going to be 4 minus 0, that's 4, divided by a delta T of 0. Plug that into your calculator, 4 divided by 0, what happens? Yeah, your calculator explodes, there's shrapnel all over, people get hurt. Okay? You don't do that. Okay? What that means is that if you try to force this to be instant, an invisible battery will, will rise up that can be as large as it needs to be to fight that change. Okay? As large as it needs to be. Now, what happens in practice is that instead of jumping up to 4 amps, you've got to gradually ramp up to 4 amps. It takes time to get there. And the bigger the self-inductance, the longer it's going to take to get there. If I look at right here where I close the switch, right before I close the switch and right after I close the switch, can't be very different. I can't change that current instantly. I've got to gradually ramp it up. <laughs> Likewise, if I want to turn current off, if I want to take it from 4 amps down to zero, I can't just drop it down to zero. I've got to gradually ramp it off. That's what that spark was when you unplugged the, uh, the waffle line. Now here's a bigger spark. Watch that again.
I showed you that little clip before when we were talking about V plus IR. But now we can talk about why the V was so big. What they were trying to do is disconnect a city from the power station. Well, that city had all sorts of transformers in it, all sorts of coils, all sorts of self-inductance. And all of those coils did not want to change their current from something down to nothing instantly. And so when they broke the line, when they forced it to be disconnected, it said, no way. you got to gradually ramp us down. And that was a big enough invisible battery to throw a spark <coughs> meters. Remember, it takes 30,000 volts to throw a spark a centimeter. That's many tens of millions of volts that is generated to fight that change in current. Now, I have a, a little demo of that. What I have here are two power supplies that will act as batteries connected uh, through two bulbs. Now, in both cases, I have the same amount of resistance in the circuit. This is just a little resistance that's variable. And uh, here, the resistance is in all of those coils. But in here, in this circuit, in addition to the resistance, I have the inductance. And the inductance is amplified by the fact that it's filled with this iron core. Now, let me turn off the... Uh, let me turn off the lights. You don't have to go to sleep. You can if you want. When I close this switch, you're going to see the two lights go on, but they won't go on together. When I open the switch, you're going to see a green spark, because these are copper leads, uh, on the side that has the inductor, but not on the other. So I turn on the power supply, I close the switch, that one goes on almost instantly. This one had to gradually ramp up. Now when I open the switch, watch the spark on this side with the inductor. See the spark? I did. Take my word for it. Spark. Okay. Now, I miss the University of Washington sometimes. They had that, uh, they had that great big huge Mondo coil that we made into the railgun, and then the delay was just very, very long. And when you open the switch, you got a great big arc, a uh, green arc. Now, here's the danger. Some of you are seeing that demo and learning the wrong thing. You're thinking, oh, well, the current over here has to go around and around and around and around. I'm almost there. Wait, wait for it. I'm almost there. I'm going to get there. Wait for it. Oh. And then it goes on. That's not what's happening. If I unwind this wire and lay it from Belgrade and back, and hit that switch, the light will go on instantly. It has nothing to do with the length of wire. It has to do with the fact that the wire is coiled. If I just lay it out straight, pow, turns right on. It's the coil that's fighting the change. Okay? Now, if you turn your exam preparation sheet over, you have this Now, what we're going to find is that an inductor acts exactly the opposite as a capacitor. You remember that for a capacitor, the voltage across the capacitor depended on how much charge was in the capacitor. And when it was empty, <coughs> When Q was zero, it acted like a what? Like a zero volt battery or a wire. Later, when the capacitor is full, it acts like what? Like an open switch.
Okay. Well, we're going to find that this inductor acts just the opposite. Watch. Watch and be amazed. Okay. Now, you remember with a, a circuit that had an, a capacitor, there were three times that I could answer questions. Right after I closed the switch when the capacitor was empty, a long time after I closed the switch when the capacitor was full, and then after the switch had been closed a long time, right after I opened it again. Same thing's true with an inductor uh, circuit. The same three times. Immediately after the switch is closed, a long time after the switch is closed, after the switch has been closed for a long time, and immediately after it's then opened. Those are the three times. Now, with the switch open, there's no current anywhere. Particularly, there's no current through that inductor. If I close that switch, I can change the current through R1 instantly. It goes from zero <coughs> up to four amps instantly. But I can't change the current through an inductor instantly. It's got to ramp up. So what's the current through an inductor? <coughs> zero amps. And so what's that inductor acting like? An open, An open switch. Oh, <laughs> the anti-capacitor. The capacitor acted like a wire when I closed the switch, and a long time after I closed the switch, it acted like an open switch. Well, an inductor acts like an open switch when I close the switch, the real switch, and a long time later, after it stops fighting, it acts like a wire. So. The magnitude and direction of the conventional current through the battery, well, the current, if it can't go through the inductor, has to go this path. And so V equals R gives me 200 volts pushing current through 45 plus 5, 50 ohms in series. And that's where I get the 4 amps up. <coughs> and then that 4 amps would come down here, and that four amps would come down there, and the four amps would go there, and then back around. Now, what is the voltage difference across the inductor? Now, we've got this formula that gives you the voltage difference across an inductor. It'll be on the front page of the final. The voltage across an inductor is equal to minus L delta I over delta T. Don't you ever use that. Don't. If you try to use that, you're going to confuse yourself. The only time you can use this is when you're saying, oh, the I is not changing, so delta I is zero. So the inductor <coughs> is zero. Because I don't know how quickly I'm trying to change the current, I don't know how to use this formula. But I do know how to find the voltage across an open switch or an empty socket. What do I do? Look away. Look away from the sun. Don't look at the sun, look away from the sun. I've got four amps going through 45 ohms over there. V equals R. Four times 45 is 180 volts. If there's 180 volts from here to here, there's 180 volts from there to there. So it would be 180 volts, and it would be oriented with the positive up to fight the current. Is this making sense? Is this feeling familiar? Now, the next part, B, is a long time after the switch is closed. Remember, if I plot the current through the inductor, I close the switch here, and it ramps up to its final value. Well, a long time means up here, where it's 40 amps, 40 amps, 40 amps, 40 amps, 40 amps, 40 amps. What's the change in I? Zero. And so what is the voltage difference across that inductor? Zero. What's it acting like? 
a wire. A long time afterwards, it acts like a wire. Now, if that is a wire, where's the current going to go? Is it going to go through R1 or through that wire? Through the wire. That means R1 is shorted out. That means all the current is going to go through the inductor, through R2, and back around. If I use V equals IR, now I've got 200 volts pushing current through, oh, it's just going through R2. 5 amps. I'm sorry, 5 ohms. And that gives me an I of 40 amps up. Okay? The voltage difference across the inductor is zero. It's acting like a wire. And what's the magnitude and direction of the conventional current through resistor R1? Zero. It's shorted out. Now, folks, we have run out of time. But on Wednesday and Friday, we're just going to practice, practice, practice. We're going to see that these inductors act just the opposite as capacitors. See you on Wednesday, people.